Kent isn't the biggest river in the world. Far from it, indeed. But its 200 miles or so of water have reflected the history of the Western world for more than a thousand years. The builders of its narrow, humpbacked bridges and the succeeding generations of patient fishermen along its banks inherited their way of life from all over Europe. Romans, Saxons and Normans crossed its stream and camped along its banks to put down roots and grow within sight of its willows into the fabric of the life of England. For this is the Thames that flows towards the sunrise and the sea from the very center of the heart of England. Within 50 miles of its source, the fat, round hills of the Cotswolds open out to the wide meadowland which reaches up to the grey walls of Oxford. Five o'clock in the morning of the 1st of May, and already some of the undergraduates are waiting under Magdalen Tower to hear the choir high above them sing their Latin hymn for the 456th May morning in succession. by the antiquity of Oxford. To be amazed that St. Edmund Hall was founded 700 years ago, or that Edward the Black Prince studied at Queen's, would be to miss the whole point of what it is that makes Oxford one of the most fascinating places in the world. For this is essentially a city of adventure of the mind, in which the development of penicillin went on comfortably side by side with Donish probings into classical antiquity. As for the present generation, Oxford has no intention of joining the respectable academic dead. And the same studious young people who wrestle with the chained books in Merton Library can be relied upon, as soon as the day's work is over, to take us back to the heart of the mid-20th century. On the river, of course. Twenty miles downstream from Oxford, the river comes to a little town with a famous name, Henley. Henley Regatta is not only the most famous of its kind in the world, and one of the oldest, but on a sunny summer's day, it is a fabulous occasion for all the thousands who flock to it. The people who come for the picnic. The people who despise mere picnics. The sturdy traditionalists who have marked all the best pubs on their itinerary for the day. And even, of course, the people who come to watch the rowing. take your pleasure seriously, like the oarsman, or whether you prefer to leave the work and the worry to others, 
The Thames has something to offer you from its store of riches. On any summer's day, the man at the wheel is ready to carry you with him. Down the sunlit highway of the river, past dreaming ranks of willows, into a holiday experience that you will remember for a long, long time to come. The steamers and the motorboats, the cruisers and the rowing boats, would in fact not have enough water to keep them afloat, were it not for the series of locks that bring the river down in graceful steps from St. John's in Gloucestershire to Teddington and Richmond, where the tidal water starts. Scant eight miles downstream from Henley, Marlow Church swings into view around a bend in the river. And for a brief moment, the surge of broken water is heard again as an arm of the river plunges over Marlow Weir. From here on, history and the affairs of men are beginning to crowd in on every side. Above the long curve of Cliveden Reach stands the great mass of Cliveden House towering above its terraced gardens. Cliveden, although it's seen its share of politicians and statesmen, is a private country house. Looks across the river valley to where, with all the realm to choose from, the kings of England have their country home, dominating the river from its hilltop above Windsor. The drum towers and walls that Henry III built to replace the fortress of William the Conqueror have themselves become, with the passing centuries, embedded in the building of successive monarchs. Plantagenet, York and Lancaster, Tudor, Stuart and Hanover. A history of royal architecture retold by the finest building of them all, the great chapel of St. George. Begun in 1473 by Edward IV, the chapel was altered and embellished in many succeeding reigns. Here hang the historic insignia of the Knights of the Garter, and above the black oak stalls their banners hang. Here lies the gentle King Henry VI and the man who supplanted him, Edward IV builder of the chapel. Here were buried Henry VIII and Jane Seymour, and here was brought the body of King Charles I after his execution. Memories of triumph and tragedy long past spun now into the thread of history. Windsor Castle owes its importance, indeed its existence, to the river, which was the great highway from London bringing to Windsor kings and diplomats, messengers and armies. Along this stretch of river on a day in June, 1215, traveled King John on one of the most important journeys in history a journey which was to end upon the fields of Runnymede and set up a milestone in the history of the freedom of mankind. From the memorial on the green meadow of Runnymede, we can see in our mind's eye the tents of the barons and hear the voice of King John cry out, By God's teeth, I will not grant them liberties which will make me a slave. But grant them he did, and the world is the better for it. 
A little below Runnymede, the Palace of Hampton Court provides the thoughtful tourist with the reflection that however much Magna Carta may have broken the royal power, by the 16th century, royal favourites were still not too badly off. For Wolsey's great house cost the ambitious cardinal in money, and later in the envy that destroyed him. Time on this river is no fixed dimension, and who knows whether around the next bend the clock may be turned back or forward. unnoticed, London has been slipping quietly past on either bank. And now to the south, the cheerful din of Battersea Fairground echoes over the water. and higher we rise until suddenly we are free of the din below and see spread out before us the great city. And in the heart of it, the Houses of Parliament flanking a curve of the river we have followed from a shallow ford to the great span of Waterloo Bridge. Below Waterloo Bridge come Blackfriars, Southwark and London bridges. Then suddenly we are among ships and the last great bridge across the Thames lies ahead of us. For a hundred years, the symbol of London, Tower Bridge. Thousands upon thousands of visitors to London have watched the arms of Tower Bridge open, but none of them till now has seen the tremendous iron counterbalances sink into their echoing caves of brick beneath the river. Close by the bridge, the shadows of night fall on the Tower of London. And tonight, as every night for more than 600 years, the chief warder and the guard carry the keys of the tower to the resident governor for safekeeping.
High above, in their narrow chamber in the Wakefield Tower, the crown jewels of England glow in the shaded light. A beam falls on the imperial state crown, and burning in the center of it, the great ruby of Edward the Black Prince. <laughs> Now the first hint of morning is in the air, and one by one the ships are moving out with the tide, away from London and the river, the river that is scarcely a day's drive in length, most of it hardly a stone's throw across, but which with Tiber and with Jordan has carried the western world a long stage on its way. Now the first shadow of a wave touches the water, and this is no longer the river, this is the sea. 